So in the light of that story, let's spend some time to begin with looking at Jesus' approach to the people who were called sinners. And I use that phrase, who were called sinners, because one of the things that Jesus taught clearly and showed was that we all fall short of God's perfect standard and are all sinners. It's just that some of us are better at hiding it than others. Rees, our pastor at Kersalem, recently spoke on the parable of the prodigal son. And we saw very clearly that while the prodigal son was clearly lost, so was his brother, who was lost in his own self-righteousness. But Jesus knew very well how people thought then, and he knows how we think now. Listen to some words later on in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus talks about the complaints of the Pharisees, firstly about John the Baptist, and then about him. For John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Again, later in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 19, Jesus explains after changing Zacchaeus' life, Today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So how does Jesus approach those who are classified publicly as sinners? Well, very simply, he doesn't deal with them differently. He doesn't put them in a box that that says sinners and how to deal with them. Our tendency is to classify people in a certain way, and those classifications dictate how we spend our time, mostly with people who are similar to us. Jesus saw this very, very clearly in the self-righteous religious class of his day. He was radically different to that. How could he seek and save the lost if he didn't spend time with them? So Jesus spent time with them and not just respectable people. And what a privilege they had. God himself, in his fullness, spending time with them in his son, Jesus. This was a fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy that he himself had personalised when he read those amazing words in the synagogue in Nazareth, again in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. Listen to this dramatic telling of that story. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he spends time with them. Next, he loves them and does not condemn them. We see this most clearly in the fantastically dramatic story of the woman caught in adultery. And every time I look at this story, I'm struck by the fact that no attention at all is given to the man. Although, because it was adultery, clearly there were two people involved. But that's an aside. A woman has been caught in adultery and the Pharisees set a trap for Jesus and bring before him this woman. And there's no defence here. There's no protestation of innocence. They present the woman to Jesus and they challenge him to deal with this most blatant of sinners who is guilty as charged. And then we read these words noted in John's Gospel. 